the summer of 1940, Britain was in terrible danger. Nazi Germany was planning to invade our shores. Only the fighter pilots of the Royal Air Force could stop them. 70 years ago, in these very skies above our head, there was a brutal and savage war that was waged, the outcome of which determined our very existence as a nation on this island. This is my brother, Colin, who was a fighter pilot in the RAF and who served in some of our modern conflicts. And I know from my experience there's a huge network of people supporting our pilots. And we want to discover how their contributions combined to give us victory in 1940. And what it was that made the Battle of Britain Britain's finest hour. We've always been fascinated by the Battle of Britain. Now we're going to meet the real-life heroes who inspired us when we were kids. These are the last of the 3,000 pilots who saved our country. The men Winston Churchill called the few. We'll explore the technology that enabled the RAF to withstand the Nazi attack. We'll find out about the dangers the fighter pilots faced. And Colin will go through the same training as Battle of Britain Airmen. If he makes the grade, he'll fly one of the greatest fighter planes of all time. The Spitfire. Amazing machines, extraordinary characters. So let us share with you one of the most remarkable stories in our history. June 1940, the leader of Nazi Germany, Adolf Hitler, was on a victory tour. Paris was the latest capital to fall to his invincible armies. In less than a year, almost all of Europe had been overrun. Only one small and isolated country was left in the war. Hitler was convinced that Britain would have to surrender, and soon. But the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was determined to continue the fight, whatever the cost. He rallied his countrymen with one of the few weapons he had, words. What General Vagan has called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. We did expect an invasion. I mean, all the signposts had been taken down and all the names on stations and things, which gave you a, a sense of something, uh, something serious could happen. Only 20 miles away, there was the most powerful army and air force in the world. So on one or two occasions, it was suggested that the invasion bells were going to be rung. And yes, it was a, it was a bit heart-stopping that that might be the last battle. The German invasion was codenamed Operation Sea Lion. It had to take place in September before the weather turned bad and the English Channel became too rough to cross. The first step was for the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, to destroy the RAF so they could land troops on the south coast. Only a few fighter pilots could prevent this invasion. The fate of our country depended on their skill and their courage. You know, they were fighting for us. We're all sitting here because of what they did. 
you know, we all owe them a great deal of gratitude for that. I think in the RAF, there's a, there's a real camaraderie with the pilots that's very like a brotherhood, like a fraternal kind of thing going on there. So having a couple of brothers tell the story is maybe not such a bad idea. I think we grew up uh, with old planes in that we were always making them. We were always building airfix models of Spitfires and Hurricanes and we'd hang them from the ceiling on bits of fishing wire or something. So there was a, there was a complete romanticism about it, uh, a romantic aspect to the planes and the pilots and um, very kind of gung-ho and chocks away and, you know. That kind of sowed the seed in my head, I guess, from maybe about the age of nine or ten. Um, and I used to read Commando comics as well and uh, they were just full of stories of Spitfire aces and, and it was it kind of started from there, really. Twenty years later, I'd become a pilot. I flew one of the RAF's frontline fast jets, the Tornado GR4. It was big, heavy, but really responsive, really comfortable, uh, lots of power, very nice airplane to fly. I was able to fly once with Colin in his Tornado. They arranged for me to take a ride in the navigator's seat. And when we took off, the feeling of acceleration and the force of uh, you push back into your seat flying at that speed was just unbelievable. He was completely relaxed, completely in his zone. And um, I was so proud of him. I've never felt such pride really before. I, I was able only to see the corner of his helmet down the side of the cockpit. But I'd never seen him at work before, you know, in, in flying this extraordinary aircraft. This is where my RAF career began, Cranwell in Lincolnshire. It's a spiritual home of the Air Force, the place where raw recruits have been turned into officers almost since the RAF began. When I arrived here 20 years ago, I was just the latest in a long line of airmen. Many Battle of Britain pilots went to Cranwell too. My brother's two years older than I am and um, was always very uh, academic and he was sporting was the captain of the cricket team, always had fantastic looking girlfriends, of one of whom I was, will always be slightly in love with. I won't mention any names. And uh, then went off and learned to fly very early, like in, when he was 16 or 17, got a flight scholarship from the RAF. Parade! Turn! To the front! And Cole was always quite set on coming right. here, or being in the RAF. So he learned to fly and then went to university and then came here after that. And Colin at university was mainly just drunk all the time, really. And, um, and then he came here and was mainly drunk here instead. <laughs> <laughs> he came more of a classy drunk here. He was more of a kind of officer type drunk here. So my picture's up here somewhere. Which I think it's quite funny. So if you read down 127, 131. Here it is, 131. Is that you right at the end? <laughs> oh, I, Flight Officer C.J. McGregor, B.S.C. Bullshit. <laughs> Certificate. <laughs> and you're right next to the box. Oh. Prime place, prime position. Well, everybody gets to see it. And this filtering process proved... I spent 18 weeks at Cranwell before graduating as an RAF officer. But it was only then that my flying training began. It was another four years before I was sent to the front line. In my case, Iraq. Seventy years ago, it was very different. The RAF was so short of men that training was cut back. Inexperienced pilots had as little as ten hours solo flying before being sent to the front line. I started flying in the autumn of 1938. And in six months, I did eight hours flying, because we only flew at weekends. And the weather was dreadful in 1938, so I didn't have much opportunity to fly. And I was, uh, continued my flying training on Hawker Hearts and Hawker Furies, still biplanes. And it was all First World War stuff. And, you know, there was no mention of Spitfires or Hurricanes or anything like that. And then, in the spring of 1940, I was sent to a fight to Scotland. I find it amazing that these men could be sent into battle with only a few hours of solo flying under their belts. 
it's impossible to fully understand what that was like. But I want to get some sense of what they went through. So I'm going to experience flying training, as it was done back in 1940. We're on our way to Duxford. Started three days of uh, flying, 1940 style, so uh, I know that I've got, I've got to prove that I can fly these two aircraft first before they're going to let me loose on Spitfire. And so there's a bit of pressure. Uh, I can definitely get a sense of that already. You're always nervous about flying an aircraft for the first time, so um, how are you going to get on? But hopefully experience will take over. The guy who'll be training me is Air Marshal Cliff Spink. Cliff was a top RAF fighter pilot. He's been flying classic planes for the last 20 years. Cliff. Hey, Colin. Nice Welcome. to meet you. Yeah, Thank you. And you. Were you ready for this thing? Uh, I think I'm ready, yeah. yeah. Um, getting pretty excited about it. Just don't excite me too much. <laughs> Try not to. <laughs> uh, so if you'd want to get your kit on, yeah. and then we're going to look at the, uh, the operational All machinery. Right. Brilliant. Can't wait. All right. Great. There you go. Thank you very much indeed. Go and put your knickers on. <laughs> OK, <laughs> cheers. Cheers, now. We're going to be flying dual all the time. Yeah. If we have an emergency... Colin's obviously an experienced jet pilot, okay. but the techniques and skills, uh, we've almost got to unlearn him uh, to build him back up so he can fly a prop aeroplane. And one of the biggest problems associated with prop aeroplanes is the fact that you've got to manage the whole aeroplane. You've got to understand the engine, you've got to manage the engine in a way where you prop speed, the engine power, everything is mechanical. There's no concession to computers at all. Right, the machinery. Yeah. We'll start with the Tiger Moth, okay. which is entirely appropriate to what was going on in World yeah, War sure. II. Thousands of those guys cut their teeth yeah. flying yeah. on the Tiger Moth. Yeah. Then we'll graduate to the Harvard, which was sort of the advanced flying yeah. training. So we've got quite a tight program. Yeah. In some ways, Colin, that's not unrealistic because there's a time compression there, um, which was very much time compression in, in World War II, yeah. where those guys were so badly needed at the front line that they were really yeah, being pushed through. through yeah. okay. and it really will be, even the time compression in yeah. its own way. Yeah. Program. So we'll be doing that on Friday then, yeah? Oh. <laughs> With the RAF so short of pilots, it needed to ease its trainees into very fast and potentially dangerous fighter planes, like this Spitfire. Because they were very basic, Tiger Moths were perfect for teaching trainees how to fly. The first thing to do was learn how to take off and land. And it was a very different technique back then. In modern planes, you have a third wheel at the front of the plane. But in these old aircraft, it's at the back, which is why they're known as tail draggers. In a tail dragger, you have to land with all three wheels touching down at the same time. It's a tricky technique to master. And I've only got one day to get it right. In these old aircraft, you have to use your feet to move the rudder. It's the rudder that helps steer the plane. I've got to get my feet moving to get the Tiger Moth going in the direction I want. And now you it it's not as easy as it sounds. That's it. That's right. OK, so we're clear to go. Yep. Let her ride up onto the main wheels. OK. OK, keep up nice and straight. Yep. That's it. Now... That's it. Hip off arm. Let her level a bit, Colin. OK. Just get a bit of uh, speed, OK? Yeah. That's it. We're going a bit sideways at the moment. Yeah. And I'm getting a draft with my right here. Right, yeah, got you, yeah. So, um... You've got to keep the instructor happy by not making him cold. OK. He just needs smooth and progressive use of the rudder. OK. I'm freezing my nuts off, so I'm going to wear my jacket next time. That's <laughs> eventually it. Tiger Moth was the ultimate plane. You could do anything you liked as a Tiger Moth. It was an absolute delight to fly, very light, 
You could loop the loop with it and do all sorts of things. They were fragile and, and uh, easy to damage, but touch wood I never actually damaged one. A tornado has a top speed of 900 miles an hour, and a tiger moth is just over 100. It really is like travelling back in time, but I love the freedom you feel in this open cockpit. After some practice, my feet are getting used to controlling the rudder, but I've still got the most difficult part ahead. I've got to land the Tiger Moth on all three wheels. Now, OK, nice speed, nice approach. Power off now, power off. That's it. That's it, speed's good. Keep it coming down. Down a bit more. Keep that throttle closed. Oh, that's it. OK, keep it straight. Couple little hops. Yep. That'll be acceptable, sir. <laughs> OK. Right. That's good. OK. Just spring it to a halt now. This is this point you understand you've got <laughs> no <a> brakes. <laughs> this is like going back to school again. <laughs> but it was good. I told him he's got to keep the wind out of the instructor's ear. He also owes me a beer <laughs> for bouncing the aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> The RAF was on a steep learning curve in 1940. Most of its fighter pilots had never been in action before. Facing them was a truly formidable enemy. The Luftwaffe had been battle-hardened by years of war. It had fought campaign after campaign across Europe. Every enemy it encountered, it had destroyed. Key to its success was one of the best fighter planes of all time, the Messerschmitt 109. The 109 could cruise at 350 miles an hour and was armed with two cannon which could blast enemy planes out of the skies. On the eve of battle, the German high command was super confident. They outnumbered the RAF by four to one. This campaign would be like all the others. They would crush the Royal Air Force in a matter of weeks. The RAF faced almost overwhelming odds. But it did have one secret weapon which helped level the playing field, radar. These masts outside Dover are the last survivors of what was in 1940 the most sophisticated air defense system in the world. Radar worked by sending out a radio beam. If the beams hit enemy aircraft, they bounced back. Radar gave the RAF 20 minutes warning of a German attack. It allowed fighter command to send the right amount of aircraft to the right place at the right time. In 1940, Britain had a chain of these masts all along the coast. But they were just the front line of the air defense system. Inland, there was also the Observer Corps, 30,000 plane spotters who tracked each enemy raid. Information from radar and the Observer Corps was sent to Fighter Command headquarters. They then alerted the fighter groups who'd scramble their planes. The mastermind behind this system was the head of Fighter Command. He's a hero of the Battle of Britain, though few nowadays would know his name. To find out more about him, I've dragged Colin away from his training to meet Stephen Bungay, a Battle of Britain expert. So who was this guy who was in, ch in charge of fighter command at that time? He was a teetotaler who lives with his sister, who talks to the dead, believes in fairies, and thinks that he is the reincarnation of a 13th century Mongol chieftain. So this is the guy in charge of fighter command in 1940. And this was Dowding? Hugh Caswell Tremon here. Doubting. Tremon here doubting. Yes, what a name. Right. However, he had two characteristics, along with all this eccentricity, that above all others, were needed then, which was great imagination and great attention to detail. And he often found those in different people, he brought them all together. Right. And he constructed, between the time he took over Fighter Command, 1936, and when war broke out, what is by far the most formidable air defence system in the world. It's one of the most extraordinary 
intellectual and technological feats of the 20th century. It is, in fact, I mean, it's so far forward-looking, what he created, in fact, was an internet, except that it was analog, so you didn't send emails, right? Yeah. You sent something on the teleprinter yeah. and you didn't grab your Blackberry or whatever. It was the telephone. Same principle, a network, a command and control system, which didn't only mean that everybody could talk to everybody, but it was extremely robust. Amazingly, an updated version of Dowding's system still protects us today. I've come to RAF Scampton in Lincolnshire, a modern radar station, to see how it works. So, Mark, what are we looking at on the screen here? OK, primarily we're looking at the UK airspace, really, and the number of aircraft that are flying within it at one given time. So every line on the screen there uh, represents a flight? Absolutely. I mean, every plot represents a, a radar return. OK. And you're looking at civilian aircraft and military aircraft? The whole, the whole raft of them. Everything that's Absolutely. in the air? Yeah, all of it. How big an area are we looking at? Uh, we're looks looking at basically a million uh, square miles. A million square a miles? A million square miles. My goodness. Wow. Wow. The technology is light years ahead of what they had in 1940, but the system is pretty much the same. If rogue aircraft are spotted, then fighters are scrambled. It's something they train for time and time again. SD, I have two unidentified aircraft coming in from the north. Can I man up? What's that mean? Okay, we've got here, we've got uh, two aircraft that have uh, entered UK airspace. Uh, they've not met the rules and procedures for routing and recognition. So what we're doing now is that uh, we're getting everyone in, uh -huh. uh, including the master controller, to look at these aircraft and see what threat they, they present to us, and then necessarily he'll take uh, tactical action. Codex B Operations and QRA, this is the Scapton Master Controller, acknowledge. Clive, flight level 400, set speed, back 1 decibel 2. Yeah, so he's scrambling the aircraft now in response to the 200 aircraft in the north of the airspace. For QRA call sides, Q1 and Q2, scramble, 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 acknowledge. These typhoons are doing the same job as Spitfires 70 years ago. But back then, there were no training exercises. Every scramble was for real. By July 1940, the Luftwaffe was ready to launch its air onslaught. More than 1,000 fighters and 1,800 bombers were poised to strike. The Battle of Britain was about to begin. For Hitler's invasion to take place, the Nazis had to drive the Royal Navy out of the Channel. Then they could ferry tens of thousands of troops across to the south coast. It was the job of the Luftwaffe's bombers to destroy the British ships. One of these attacks was recorded by the BBC. There were one, two, three, four, five, six, so about ten German machines dive bombing the British convoy, which is just out to sea in the channel. There's one going down on its target now. On bases across the country, airmen waited for the order to intercept the bombers. Tom Neal was a 20-year-old Hurricane pilot. On his radio, he could hear the build-up of each German attack. This information would be relayed to us, and we'd be standing there, and, and the information could, well, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 200, 300, oh, my God, you know, 300, 400. And you knew they were coming towards you. And you look round, there were just 12 of you. Where do you start? You know? Guarding the bombers were the Messerschmitt 109s. Tackling these fighters was an almost impossible task for rookie pilots. They had to rush up behind us, 100 miles an hour faster than us, fire their guns from very close range, then disappear, either upwards or downwards. We could never catch them. Because they used to watch us attacking the bombers, and they used to come down and attack us from behind. Surviving the first few dogfights was a lottery for inexperienced pilots. 
Tony Iveson had only 10 hours on a Spitfire before he was sent to his fighter squadron. The first few trips were the most dangerous, but I, you just had to be lucky. And I mean that. I don't know why um, one was selected to be lucky, but <laughs> you had to be. Despite the lack of experienced pilots, the RAF put up a good fight. German planes were shot down at a rate of two to one. But the Nazis still sunk so many ships that within two weeks, the Royal Navy stopped sailing through the Channel. In the Battle of Britain, it was round one to the Germans. It's the second stage of my 1940s training regime. Having learnt the basics of flying on the Tiger Moth, trainee pilots transferred to a much more sophisticated American-built plane called the Harvard. I'm a bit more nervous this morning. I, know, I can't really work out why, but I find myself pacing around a little bit more, I'm quite conscious of it. And um, Whereas yesterday it was kind of rock up and just go flying in a pretty basic little Tiger Moth, you know. But today's the real crunch day, I think, you know. Just got to kind of calm down a little bit. The Harvard was the next step up from the Tiger Moth. And because it's a monoplane and has just one wing, it handles much more like one of the RAS frontline fighters. You ready for this? <laughs> I'm ready as I'll ever be, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm the one who gets nervous when you nervously <laughs> laugh, OK? Yeah. The Harvard is a very, very good trainer. I mean, the historical context for this is that there were literally thousands and thousands of these built, and they were the, the standard advanced trainer in the Second World War. It's got 600 horsepower, but it's a pretty heavy aeroplane. It weighs almost as much as a Spitfire. So it plods a bit, the Harvard, but it does its <laughs> job. The most nerve-jangly moments are always the takeoffs and landings. In the year leading up to the Battle of Britain, more than 200 pilots died in training alone. I had a, a, an enormous crash on my first solo night flight. I got into a steep turn as I took off, and that was it. So we went up in the air and down again, and crashed 200 miles an hour with such force that the engine jumped off and finished 200 yards away from the plane. That's what saved me, otherwise, if the engine still been there, it would have caught, caught fire. And all that was left of the plane was a little bit of seating where I was sitting. And uh, I walked back to the aerodrome and walked into the crew room, and everybody thought they were seeing a ghost because they'd sent out an ambulance to bring back the body. OK, off you go then. wonderful aircraft. It's so advanced for its uh, age, you know, being American. It had a lot of power and a nice snappy engine and an automatic undercarriage, which was something we weren't used to. You're looking like a real fighter pilot up there, the first time. I mean, no RAF aircraft I heard of had been blessed with such modern sanitation. <laughs> it had a tube which fixed to a clip under the seat. And so if you got caught short in on, the, on a sort of hour or two's trip, then you could use this tube, you see. But the trouble was that if you were doing aerobatics and you did a roll and it wasn't properly clipped, this thing would drop itself and dangle in front of your face. And you don't know who'd used it last. <laughs> OK, that's very Those cockpit and modern controls make me feel much more at home than in the Tiger Moth. The Harvard can cruise at 200 miles an hour. It's powerful and sturdy, 
a really comfortable plane to fly. Now that's a nice, that's a nice speed now. That's fine. Just a little tad fast to get the power back. That's it. Now as she comes down, ready to get the power and ready for the flare. I hate you, young man. <laughs> Very nice landing. Very nice landing. I think it's been a pretty successful trip, but it's up to Cliff to decide if I've done enough to fly the Spitfire. We're now going from something which is lively, but not overly lively. Yeah. You're going to a real thoroughbred. Yeah. It's definitely chocks away tomorrow, if that's the right saying. Yeah, um, so have a, have a good sleep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll see I'll go and check my insurance policy. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> I still can't believe that's actually going to happen. It's, it's just um, one of the wildest dreams as a pilot and uh, as a kid, growing up watching air shows and what have you. And, uh, you know, I've got less than 24 hours and I'm actually going to be doing it. So it's just, you know, fantastic. Everyone's heard of the Spitfire. It's one of the most famous aircraft of all time. But there were two British fighters in 1940. The other, often overlooked aircraft, is the Hurricane. There were 1,700 Hurricanes and less than 400 Spitfires. The Hurricane was the workhorse of the Battle of Britain. The Hurricane was never as eye-catching as its rival, was lumpier and bumpier, based on a much older aircraft design. Chop the top wing off a biplane and you see how the Hurricane evolved. Only the front end had a metal skin. The rear section was built out of a wooden frame covered in canvas. It sounds primitive, but this made the Hurricane easy to repair. The Hurricane had the same Merlin engine as the Spitfire, but it was less aerodynamic, so it was never as fast. To find out more about both of these planes, we're meeting up with Flight Lieutenant Anthony Parkinson from the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. The BBMF has a unique collection of historic planes. So, Parky, we're here with the two leading players in the uh, British side, the Hurricane and the Spitfire. And as I've been thinking about this, I've always fancied myself as a Hurricane pilot, you know, more of a Hurricane man. Well, and call quite it, funny, it, I've always kind of thought of myself as a bit of a Spitfire sort of guy. Right. And yeah. here, standing by, I realise that I'm, I am. I prefer it. So what's the difference? What, what's the difference in... Because you fly them both. I do, yeah. Um, they're actually both beautiful to fly. You know, they're not that different. I guess the Spitfire has the edge on performance. It's faster. The Hurricane probably turns slightly better, but they're both fabulous aircraft to fly they're yeah. easy once you get them airborne you know they're, they're they're not difficult and you can see why the guys would have loved flying them in the war in terms of their handling qualities their performance mm -hmm. pretty awesome for their for their time this one was earlier this is a, this was around before the spitfire the hurricane right yeah physically it was it was an earlier generation and you can see the sort of the canvas on it the spitfire is all metal design yeah. it's got a much thinner elliptical beautiful wing mm -hmm. you know the spitfire really was state-of-the-art all metal construction and it would have been like looking at the, the space shuttle in 1940, yeah. you know, a sort of 400 mile an hour performance aircraft. Yeah. It was breathtaking. 400 mile an hour? Yeah. Wow. I didn't know it went that fast. And what were their roles? What were the different roles for them? Uh, I think they tended, if possible, for the, the Spitfires to go more for the fighters and, and the Hurricanes more for the bombers. And that was just purely based maybe on turning performance because the, yeah, the Spitfire yeah, could outturn exactly. a, a 109. I think the Hurricane actually could outturn a 109 as well, really? but the, it was just more the, the sort of top speed, the performance of right, the Spitfire to the was point, more on parity with the 109. Yeah. And you were saying about the pilots themselves. We've, we're going to meet some of the, the, the men that flew these aircraft, but they're that they're quite, they yeah. downplay it a little bit. They do, you know, it's one of the, the joys of the job. We've almost got something in common with these heroes, you know, to sort of chat about flying a spit. Yeah. Although for us, you know, the landing's the scary bit. For them, that was just something you did between rearming. And, uh... Keep it down. <laughs> We're doing an interview for the BBC over here. Yeah, without them and without these planes, we'd be goose stepping around, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't we? Drinking schnapps, be a nightmare. I don't think, I don't think the BBC thanks for all my German friends. 
If there was one man who confirmed some of those Nazi stereotypes, then it was the supersized head of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering. Goering was vain and arrogant. He was so confident of success that he bought himself a new white suit and a shiny gold baton just to celebrate victory in the Battle of Britain. Goering exuded confidence, but he had a dark secret, and one that affected his leadership during the Battle of Britain. Goering was a junkie. He got wounded in the groin, and as a result was treated with morphine, and he became a morphine addict, which has a rather strange effect on people's moods. Um, it can make them very pessimistic and then uh, over-optimistic. It can cloud their judgment. He had no understanding of technology. He had no understanding of how to organize a complex, modern military organization. And there he was in charge of the most sophisticated of Germany's armed forces. Goering put his faith in the German warrior spirit as well as the Luftwaffe's superior numbers of planes and men. After a month of fighting over the channel, he was ready for the next step. Goering would take the war to the British mainland. The German plan was codenamed Eagle Attack. It would be the biggest air campaign seen so far in history. Eagle attack began on the 12th of August 1940 with a raid along the south coast. Three radar stations were bombed, put out of action. Without the RAF's eyes and ears, a huge stretch of southern England was wide open to attack. Emergency work began to repair the system. Partial radar coverage was eventually restored. The masts had been difficult targets for the Luftwaffe to hit. And even when they had been bombed, the RAF had got them up and running again. Goering concluded that the attacks had been a waste of time. He cancelled further systematic bombing of the radar network. Leaving Britain's air defence system in place was Goering's first great error. Whenever the Luftwaffe attacked, radar would be watching and the RAF would be waiting. Three days later, on the 15th of August, the Germans launched the second phase of Eagle Attack with a massive raid on the Midlands and North. Goering believed the RAF was so short of pilots and planes that every one of its fighter squadrons had been sent to defend the southeast. He sent more than 100 bombers to attack northern England with no fighters to protect them. When they arrived over the Yorkshire coast, they had a nasty surprise. We were having lunch, and the whole squadron suddenly heard on the RT-616 squadron, scramble, scramble. And we dashed out and got in our planes and took off in all directions. And we were sort of formed up, and we was vectored on to about 80, the Yorks 88s. And they were unescorted, and there they were, flying in formation. You couldn't miss them. The Luftwaffe had underestimated the strength of the RAF, and they were severely punished for it. 75 German aircraft were shot down. Luftwaffe pilots called it Black Thursday. One day later, the Luftwaffe attacked again. More than 400 aircraft pounded targets along the south coast. Keith Park was the commander of a living group, which covered the southeast, the front line in the Battle of Britain. Park was scrambling squadron after squadron to repel the German attack, when in the heat of battle, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill suddenly showed up. Churchill decided to visit Fighter Command's uh, 11 group headquarters in Uxbridge. He turned up unannounced, as so often, and watched events, and he said 
that when he realized that Parker got all his fighters into the sky, he felt sick with fear. The margins, he said, were so small. One of the pilots Keith Park scrambled was Nigel Rose. He was only 22, but had never been in combat before. We saw this enormous gaggle of aircraft coming in, and for one who'd never seen a German, one single German aircraft before, to see the, my squadron commander said there were 100, uh, about 50 bombers and 50 fighters. And when you see all these in one huge, great gaggle of various heights and so on, uh, that was quite impressive. So one thought, well, you know, uh, turn the gun button to fire, and uh, your squadron commander sort of said, well, pick your man. So we came round and uh, firing eight Browning machine guns at once. It, some smoke came out of, out of the aircraft. This was, a, this was a message from 110. And one thought, gosh, you know, I must have hit him or something. He turned over on his back and went absolutely vertically downwards. And I thought, gosh, this is, you know, being in a fighter squadron, and surely it's one I can claim. Some planes were fitted with cameras to film these battles in the skies. Amazingly, a few frames survive of the moment Nigel Rose fixed a German plane in his gun sights. For Winston Churchill, the 16th of August had been a deeply moving day. He'd seen for himself the almost impossible odds the RAF's fighter pilots faced. Churchill drove away in the afternoon and he turned round to General Ismay, one of his aides, in the car as they were driving back to London and said, never in the field of human conflict so much been owed by so many to so few. A few days later, of course, Churchill wove them into the speech that he gave in the House of Commons. The great air battle which has been in progress over this island for the last few weeks has recently attained a high intensity. The gratitude of every home in our island, in our empire, and indeed throughout the world, except in the abodes of the guilty, goes out to the British airmen, who, undaunted by odds, Unwearied in their constant challenge and mortal danger, are turning the tide of the world war by their prowess and by their devotion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. At the height of the Battle of Britain, there were around 1,300 fighter pilots. It really is the case that our country's fate depended on the few. Seventy years on, their ranks have thinned. Now only a hundred or so remain. So for us, it's a privilege to meet two of them. <laughs> yeah, I don't think yeah, I know the meaning of the word instinct. instinct. <laughs> <laughs> Geoffrey Wellam was 17 years old when he joined up. He recounted his experiences as a Spitfire pilot in an autobiography called First Light. It's a classic account of the Battle of Britain. Bob Foster was 20 and flew hurricanes in the summer of 1940. He was a crack fighter pilot who shot down seven German planes. When you first um, stepped into your hurricane and, and you into your Spitfire, did you and, you and you landed it successfully and stepped out and you know kind of survived that first experience? Yeah. I mean, how, yes. how did you, how oh, did you yes. feel? Were you, were you, were you really yeah. elated yeah. that you'd? Yeah. You felt you'd really, I'm now a fighter pilot. And now. in my case, a little oh, bit yeah. thankful to really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I looked down yeah. and there was the ground. I, I must have landed. <laughs> the Spitfire has landed with Jeff Wellam in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how, how much training on the aircraft did you get before you were expected to go up and use it in anger? We were posted up to begin in, I think, September the 7th, when the battle was at its height. And we replaced 87 Squadron that had been shot up and knocked about a bit mm -hmm. and the first time I ever went into real combat was there and I had about 30 hours on a spit. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky yes, mm -hmm. to, to get to that. that much. Mm -hmm. yes. A lot of pilots had less, I, I yeah. take it. Mm -hmm. And did you have a, a real sense that you were in a battle for Britain's survival at that time or were you, were you, just, you were just going up there to, to do your job? Well, yes, yeah. I mean there were invasion alerts, yeah. the church yeah. bells rang, it meant yeah. they were invaded. I mean everybody in, in the south of England was aware that it was possible, 
whether we really knew that we were in a battle for survival. I, well, I, yeah, a battle for personal survival. <laughs> yes, yeah. certainly. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. But the, the implications of the thing, I suppose we did. But it was the least of our worries, put it that way. It never really registered to me until uh, the first day we were sent off from Bigger. We were vectored on to 150 plus coming in over Dungeness. And I saw this mass of aeroplanes. Uh, looked like a lot of gnats on a summer evening you know. yeah. and I thought these chaps mean it this is serious it's the f th but that's the first reaction I really had mm. and uh, you know there's a dreadful thing where, where do we start on this lot yeah so was, I mean was there any particular day or occasion when you felt that we're, that we're gonna lose it we're gonna lose the battle and, and that was one day I do remember and this must have been mid-September I suppose where we were told to be in the cockpits an hour before dawn, which was pretty early in September, oh, yeah, five yeah. in the morning, something like that. And we thought, well, OK, the invasion's on. That was the th thought of it. Mm. We got in our airplanes an hour before dawn, sat there, and I remember sitting on the airfield at Croydon, which was a big grass airfield, with hares running around mm. and the odd airman sitting on the starter axe. So I was thinking to myself, well, if 12 little hurricanes sitting there, if if this is the invasion, then God help us. <laughs> Can I ask a slightly sensitive question about your job then, and in terms of what it was like to engage with an enemy for the first time, and if you're successful and you take down an aircraft, then how, how must that have felt? Because I, I don't know what Good. that might have felt like. It did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think we ever thought about pilots in the other aeroplane. Right. I didn't. Mm -hmm. No, not at no, I. I uh, I mean, these chaps were coming over bombing. Exactly. <laughs> they were yeah. dropping yeah. bombs right all the over the place. They started it, and so... Um, no, what yeah, were they yeah. doing over here? No, no, exactly. No, no, exactly. They're they're right here too. no, I don't think there was any... Uh, uh, dropping these bombs on mm, villages mm, and mm, just, mm, you know... And, mm. No, I personally didn't have any... No, not at all. They, they started yeah. this bloody nonsense. Mm. 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 And, and you, I mean, obviously, you know, this is going on day after day, and uh, yeah. you must have been bloody knackered, you know. Having to go up, you know, three, four times a day, maybe I more. So, yeah. We were young. We were twenty. We were enthusiastic. Yes, and we had some beer at the night. If you got to five o'clock, you think, right, the day thou gavest, Lord, is ended. You know, sort <laughs> yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, and then straight off to the White Hart of Bracedon. That's right. Rubbing shoulders with uh, local people, perhaps a game of darts, mm -hmm. suppressing thoughts of mates yeah. who haven't turned up. Well, that's right. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, mm -hmm. generally knocking back the pints and. Mm -hmm. If there was pretty jewellery around, trying to, you know, try your luck or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same with, with our own people, too. You know, people say, oh, yeah. did you miss your colleagues? And I'm, well, you did, but on the other hand, I've always said, in July, I'd never met these chaps before. Mm. I mean, they were not close friends. They yeah. were squadron, yeah. they were great chaps and so mm -hmm. on. Yes. But you couldn't allow it to get you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I you had to put it so. behind yeah, you. I mean, uh, yeah. I had one close chap, and uh, he went fairly quickly. Uh, yeah, it, um, it, it hit me. Uh, but we went down to the pub that night, and I thought, well, that's it. He's, you know, yeah. he's gone and uh, bear up. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Bear up, my soul. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And did it affect you when you got in the cockpit the next day? You no. couldn't think about no, it then, no, could you? No, no, no. You wouldn't be able to. No, it was instant. In well, fact, yeah, it was yeah. better. Mm. The waiting was the problem with me. I don't know about you. I hated it. But the moment I got in that aeroplane and felt the vibration of the engine through the seat of my pants, and I was strapped in, and the ground crew got off the wing and waved, and I felt, OK, it's up to me. Yeah. For me, there's one extra treat. Bob knows I've got a thing for hurricanes, so he took me off to meet an old comrade in arms. Not a person but a plane, the actual hurricane he flew during the Battle of Britain. <laughs> this is the only surviving hurricane which fought in the Battle of Britain that is still flying today. Amazing. Sight, isn't it? When it's coming straight at you, you do. You feel like you want to run. And... Right. Amazing sound. Yeah. It must take you right back. 
back now. Yeah, so, you it? can't miss it, can you? you can't miss it. No. Bob's Hurricane came into service at a crucial moment. Just a day after it joined his squadron, the Luftwaffe launched the bloodiest attack of the Battle of Britain. A month into the Battle of Britain and Goering was under pressure. His strategy for the destruction of Fighter Command was not going to plan. Goering had assumed that the Luftwaffe would crush the RAF, just as it had crushed every other enemy, by shooting its planes out of the skies. But the radar network and the RAF's pilots and planes had proved a match for the Germans. After weeks of air combat, the RAF was holding its own. Goering's new strategy was to destroy the RAF not in the air, but on the ground. If fighter stations were bombed, it would be difficult to take off and land. Exhausted pilots would be unable to rest. A key target was the RAF base which covered the main attack route to London, Biggin Hill. In its heyday, Biggin Hill was the most famous and important air base in the country. Its Spitfires and Hurricanes shot down 1,600 Luftwaffe planes. Those glory days are long gone now. The Air Force left Biggin Hill 20 years ago. I visited the base just before it shut down. I came here in 1987, and this was my first experience of the RAF. This is where I went through my selection to join the Air Force. Uh, so this was before Cranwell. Um, and it's, it's, I had no concept at the time as to how important a base this was in the overall uh, campaign you know, during 1940. But walking around these buildings now, and you would get a real sense of the of the past and of the ghosts, because this place took a real pounding by the Luftwaffe, and it was it was right on the front line. To find out more about what happened on the 18th of August, I joined Patrick Bishop, who is a writer and historian. He showed me the woods, which have swallowed up much of the old fighter base. I wanted to show you this, Colin. This is a a, a pillbox built in 1940. Yeah. I think it gives you an indication of how serious the fears were of an invasion. This was put here to protect the airfield against paratroopers or an, an invading force. There was a real feeling at this point that, that an invasion was inevitable. Yeah. So Biggin Hill was right on the front line and it, it took a real pounding on that on, on the 18th of August 1940. That's right. This was the day when they launched attacks on these, on these big significant bases. Uh, Biggin Hill of course being one of them, uh, and it, it's, it was a Sunday morning, so you can sort of picture the scene. In fact, we know what was going on. So this was a, a rural area, so you'd have people going off to church locally, the cooks in the canteen would be making Sunday lunch, and then the, the first reports come through that Kenley's being bombed and then Croydon's being bombed. So it's natural to assume that Biggin Hill is going to be next, which indeed it was. So. Everyone around here would have, would have seen it. They would have been looking up at, at what was going on. They would have been hearing the crump of the bombs. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, everyone knew they were on the front line at this point. Biggin Hill was attacked twice on the hardest day. 80 tons of bombs fell on the base. The runways are peppered with craters. But the hardest day was just the beginning of weeks of bombing. 12 days later, 40 people died when their air raid shelter took a direct hit. This is one of the places where fighter pilots lived out those days of fear and uncertainty. So this is a sleeping shelter. This is where the ground crews and the pilots, if they were on an early start, if they were on the sort of dawn detail, they'd come up the night before and spend the night here. Yeah. Must have been horrendous, uh, you know, conditions to live in day after day. Well, I suppose it's that feeling that there's no line that you can retreat behind where you're going to be safe, um, which must have had a, a pretty wearing effect on the nerves. There was no just, you know, you've done your fighting, you land, and then, well, that's basically you've done for the day. Mm. Um, 
And I think that be began to tell very much in that period when you're reading the memoirs, you get a very strong sense of, of people getting to the end of their tether. Yeah, because they're kind of living it 24 hours a day, you know, they're, that constant fear, not only when they're flying, but on the ground as well, they're going to get caught out. And that must have been, uh, yeah, it must have been pretty horrendous. The seeing these sleeping quarters and the dispersal areas here at Biggin Hill is really brought to home to me just how intense that period was. Um, the guys weren't just fighting for their lives in the air, you know, four or five sorties a day, but they were fighting for their lives on the ground as well, and they were living under the constant threat of bombings. And I mean, I'm used to combat sorties where you can come back at the end of a day and Albeit it's to an air-conditioned tent somewhere in the desert, but at least it's kind of home and you've got good food and you, you can sleep undisturbed. Um, but for these these guys, it was uh, it was just constant and uh, the stress must have been incredible. And they must have wondered how just how long they could keep that up. You know how much more they could take. With the Battle of Britain now in its seventh week, combat stress was beginning to tell. Many pilots were being scrambled into action four or five times a day. I found the waiting period difficult, or the most, probably the, the most difficult, because then you almost felt like going outside and throwing up, you know. Um, sitting around waiting for that telephone always had a certain ring, and the, the corporal would pick it up, they'd stick his head out the window and say, scramble, and you'd be on your feet racing to the airplane. Waiting for that to happen, I think many people would say, I find it very, very you know, very well, unsettling, as it were. You, you couldn't, you're apprehensive and uh, probably, let's face it, probably scared stiff, really. The strain of weeks of intense fighting wasn't just affecting the pilots, it had also begun to tear the leadership of Fighter Command apart. War had broken out amongst the RAF top brass about the way the battle was being fought. It pitted Keith Park, the commander of 11 Group, which covered the southeast, against one of the RAF's rising stars. Douglas Bader was already a legend when war began. He had lost his legs in a plane crash but went back to flying. In 1940, he led 12 Group, which defended the Midlands and the East Coast an area which was less involved in the battle. He was itching to get into action. He's the sort of guy who wanted to be out there leading the pack. He wanted to be number one. And the backseat role that 12 Group seemed to be playing in the battle didn't really appeal to him. Bader had his own theory on how the Battle of Britain should be fought, which he called the Big Wing. The idea was to get dozens of planes in the air at once. In one huge battle, the Big Wing would deal the Luftwaffe a killer blow. But there were practical problems with the Big Wing. Getting 50 fighters in the air took time. The Luftwaffe was often halfway home by the time Douglas Bader arrived. For Keith Park, who knew just how short of men the RAF was, the Big Wing was a dangerous gamble. Risking dozens of pilots in a single battle threatened to fatally weaken fighter command. This shortage of pilots was the critical issue as the Battle of Britain reached a decisive point. Airmen were not just being shot up by the Luftwaffe. Many were falling prey to a merciless killer. In less than a month, the RAF lost more than 200 airmen, almost all over the sea. As I know from my RAF training, if you ditch into the ocean these days, you're pretty confident you'll survive. We have immersion suits, lifeboats, and emergency supplies. So I want to know what was so different in 1940. What made the sea such a killing zone? I'm only wearing a simple flying suit, just as pilots would have done in 1940. 
What I'm experiencing is known as cold shock. I've been in a few minutes now. My hands are getting really cold, my toes are cold. And I've, uh, I'm really breathing hard. I can feel myself hyperventilating. Hyperventilating was one of the signs of cold shock. Breathing became more frantic and pilots would swallow more and more water. Most died from cold shock within five minutes. Anyone who did survive the first few minutes still had little chance of getting out alive. Because during the Battle of Britain, there was no system to rescue pilots lost at sea. And I'm uh, just kind of looking around me and it's quite choppy and I can't see anything, I can't see any. You see the odd ship every now and again when I'm popping up and down, but apart from that, it's just, um, it's just nothing. And it must have been absolutely hell. Do you think you've managed to survive getting out? It'll be a burning spitfire and suddenly this is going to be your final sort of resting place. It's just horrendous. To be honest, I think you probably just want to drown. Get over with. Because there's just no... There's no hope really of anybody coming to see you. It must be horrible. If you're lost at sea or stuck up on a mountain, you'll be lucky and these guys will come and get you. They save up to 2,000 people a year. But it's because of the people, the pilots, that ditched the sea during the Battle of Britain that we have search and rescue today. With so many experienced airmen being lost, search and rescue began. Its main task was to pick up airmen lost at sea. Oh yeah, that's him, that, that's him up ahead now. He's over here, up to our right. I'm going to do this, yeah. I'm, I'm turning in my rouge and my lipstick. I'm going to be a winch man. I like so. <laughs> Search and rescue was set up in August 1940. In the years to come, it would save thousands of lives. But it came too late to stem the losses which were seriously weakening fighter command. September, the RAF had reached its lowest ebb. They were losing far more pilots than they could replace. It was a war of attrition, and fighter command was bleeding men. It seemed that only a miracle could save the RAF from extinction, and Britain from invasion. Then, on the 7th of September, something remarkable happened the Germans launched another huge attack. 750 Luftwaffe planes flew towards the RAF's fighter stations, just as they had done for the last few weeks. But this time they passed right over the airfields and carried on towards London. The game had changed. It was now no longer about two air forces confronting each other, but it was about two nations confronting each other because they came back to Lock London that night and the night of September the 7th can be counted as the first day in what we now call the Blitz. A week earlier, the RAF had bombed Berlin. Goering had publicly declared that the German capital was safe from attack. So the bombing was a personal humiliation. He ordered a revenge raid on London. The Blitz would prove traumatic, but during the first week in which London was targeted, no bombs fell on air bases. Goering had eased the pressure on the RAF. 
Squadrons were re-equipped with new Spitfires. Fresh pilots were drafted in. Fighter command was overhauled in anticipation of the next great challenge. Finally, my big days arrived. I'm going to fly the Spitfire. And with this flight, my flying career comes full circle. Because I'll sit in the same cockpit as the heroes who inspired me to become an RAF pilot. <laughs> I can't tell you how excited I am. Um, it's just like you kind of dreamt about this moment since you were a kid, and, um, and suddenly the day's arrived, you know, and it's, and it's here. I'm, I, I'm going to do it. It's a beautiful day, and there's puffy blue, white clouds around, and blue sky. It just couldn't be any pe more perfect, so... God, I just can't really believe that it's going to happen, you know. It's fantastic, absolutely amazing. Nervous? No, I'm, I'm not nervous, I'm not nervous. I'm, um... I'm really not. I've sat in the cockpit and had a look around, and uh, I've, I have read through my notes, and it's, everything is there. And I'm, and I think that's because I've, I've had a bit of training. You know, I've gone through the training, and I've, I've done the Tiger Moth, I've done the Harvard, and it's the logical next step. And I'm, I'm really not nervous. I'm just, um, I'm just, well, you can tell, can you really? <laughs> okay, clear prop. I'm contact. Okay, contacts. Good start, well done. You'll need to kick around almost straight away with a bit of left rudder. Yeah. Flying the Spitfire won't be easy. At 350 miles an hour, she's really fast. The Spitfire's a thoroughbred who needs handling with care. We're pointing in the right direction, Colin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just sitting in the cockpit is an overwhelming experience. The Merlin engines roaring away, and there's that unforgettable smell of leather and oil and grease. Okay, guys, let's give a nice trip. Round to the right we go. You're in climbing. Climbing fast. I'm amazed at how light and agile the Spitfire is. It's really responsive to the touch. Now I understand why so many pilots have fallen in love with her. It was a real lady, a Spitfire, I mean, a beautiful aircraft, not just to look at, but to fly. Well, you had a fairly small cockpit, so that when you were sitting in it, you were very much part of the plane. You and the plane were together. Oh, it's beautiful. So smooth and almost sort of like a rhythm of it. It had all the right characteristics and it was behaved so beautifully <laughs> and was beautiful to look at. So, I mean, what more can we say? The Spitfire is wonderful in the air, but down on the ground it's a real beast to handle. Landing's the most difficult part. The Spitfire has a long nose, so it's hard to see over it to work out how close I am to the ground. Just fly down like you did the Harvard. Just fly it down. Keep it coming down. Keep it coming down. Keep it coming down. Keep it coming down. Just drop the power and hold it off. Hold it off. Hold it off. Hold it off. Very nice. Now get watch that rudder. Left rudder. Yeah, got it. Left rudder. Yeah. Left rudder. Yeah. Got it. Left rudder. Yeah. Left rudder. That's it. Don't get a wiggle up. Don't get a wiggle up. Don't get a wiggle up. That's it. Well done. Well done. 
Having a little moment. You right in the front? Yeah, yeah. Well, when the, the heartbeats come back to something which is not on danger level. <laughs> wow. That's amazing, amazing. Can't believe it's done that. It's really incredible. <laughs> oh man. Oh my god, that was I don't think I've ever had an experience like that in my life. It's just the most incredible thing to do. Quite emotional. Oh my really. god, yeah it is, it is. Well yeah, really emotional, yeah. Yeah. I, I wasn't really sure it would be, but it is. I mean there he was on a bright blue day yeah. over a green fields of England doing aerobatics in a spitfire. Doesn't get much better than that. A week of foul weather followed the first day of the Blitz. Fighter Command pilots were confined to base. Luftwaffe squadrons flying over Britain encountered very few RAF aircraft. Their reports convinced Goering that Fighter Command was down to its last 200 planes. Time was running out. He had only a few days left to destroy the RAF before Hitler's invasion had to begin. Goering believed that one more blow would crush Fighter Command. And with the bad weather breaking, the day of reckoning had arrived. This place. No, it was just kept completely under wraps. RAF Uxbridge was the nerve centre on the 15th of September, the decisive day of the Battle of Britain. I've seen this room in so many movies. Yeah, it's weird. It's, it's a real place. Weird Look at that. See it. Yeah. Look at this. Seventy years on, the room has been preserved just as Keith Park would have known it on the day he scrambled his squadrons to meet the great Luftwaffe attack. The first few hours were crucial for the outcome of the Battle of Britain. For the very first time, we've pieced together the records for each phase of the German attack. These RAF personnel will help us plot the raid moment by moment. They'll be doing exactly what their predecessors did 70 years ago. And Stephen Bungay is on hand to take us through the key moments of the 15th of September, 1940. The weather reports are good. The day is fine, there's a little bit of haze on the ground, but visibility on the ground is about four miles. Mm -hmm. It's about 14 degrees centigrade. It's a beautiful late summer day. Mm -hmm. It's great weather for strolling to the pub, reading the newspaper in the garden, and launching major air attacks. And guess what choice they made? Right, right. So on they come, and Park here is waiting for them. Keith Park didn't have to wait long. At 10 past 10, the Germans took off from their bases on the French coast. The bombers circled over the English Channel as they waited for their fighter escorts to arrive. Then Goering's great air armada began its attack run. Back in London, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill had noticed the fine weather. He sensed it would be another big day. 
He drove to Uxbridge and arrived at 10.30 as the drama began to unfold. Park went up, met him, reminded him that he couldn't light his cigar because the air conditioning down here won't cope with it. He was in here. And so he was oh, just okay. up there with an unlit cigar clenched between his teeth throughout the day. Stand by for a new raid. Hostile 04, William X-ray 06. At 10.51, the first marker went on the board. 30 hostile aircraft had been detected by Britain's air defence system. It was the spearhead of the German attack. All squadrons come to readiness, including those in release. At three minutes past 11, Park scrambled the first fighter squadrons. He sent out the Biggin Hill wing of Spitfires, two Spitfire squadrons, 72 and 92, up high to patrol Canterbury to hit them over the coast. Hmm. He sent them up to about 25,000 feet. When they arrived, they were above the German top cover. Park had laid an ambush. When the German bombers and their fighter escorts arrived over the south coast, the RAF was waiting, high above. Park's strategy was to send out Spitfires to engage the measurement 109s. 109s would be forced to fight. That would strip the bombers of their protective shield. At 11.40, the first dogfights began. Park's strategy was going to plan. While the dogfights raged, the German bombers pressed on for London. But now another unforeseen problem arose. A 90 mile an hour headwind had blown up, which cut the ground speed of the bombers in half. It would take them twice as long to reach their target. Raid hostile 04, Robert 73. Goering had promised that fighter command was finished. But German air crew had endured a terrible ordeal. They'd been attacked on all sides since they crossed the south coast, and it was about to get even worse. Keith Park now delivered his master stroke. He'd always been skeptical about the big wing and the value of a risky all out attack. But it was time for the RAF's hammer blow, so he'd summoned his great rival, Douglas Bader, to lead the charge. At nine minutes past 12, the German bombers arrived over London. To their horror, 60 big wing fighters were waiting for them. Bader launched an all out attack. There were so many British aircraft that they got in each other's way. Only six German bombers and 12 fighters were shot down. But the appearance of so many RAF planes shattered Luftwaffe morale. The psychological impact of this on the German flyers, of course, was shock. But on the commanders, it was a sudden realisation of what had actually been going on for the previous month. Yeah. We thought we got them on their knees. Oh my God, we've been getting nowhere. Yeah. We've no time left. What can we do? When the Luftwaffe finally tallied up their losses, the 15th of September had cost them 56 planes. They'd experienced far worse days. The real significance was what the battle revealed. After two months of fighting, the RAF was even stronger than before. With fighter command controlling the skies, the invasion couldn't take place. Two days later, Hitler postponed Operation Sea Lion. There's one more flight left, and it's the most amazing flight of all. There's a chance to go up in a Spitfire once more, but this time I'd be flying in formation with a Hurricane and Spitfire from the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Flying alongside other Battle of Britain aircraft is a once in a lifetime opportunity. But can I really take two trips in a Spitfire when my brother Ewan has had none? Van Tegel? How do you mean, Van Tegel? 
fancying her. How do you mean? Am I going to get to go up in it with you? No, me no. Oh, no? Well, I'd love to have a go, yeah, of course. Right. I'm not, I'm not going to go today. You're going. What do you mean you're not going today? No, you're going to go in it. Why? You're going to go in it. I'm not. I thought you were going in no, it. I'm not. She, you're going to. I'm going up in the back of it. You're going up in the back of it. Where are you going to be? I'm going to be the first day. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. But don't you, don't you feel like you'll miss out on your goal? No, oh. I've, I've had my goal. You need to see what it's like. That's why you were telling me to bring a flying suit this morning, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. OK. Here's me asking you how you parachute out of it. <laughs> this is quite well, relevant. Question to ask. Oh, my God, that's going to be amazing. There's a hurricane, then a spitfire, then at the far side of the formation, I'm in the back of the two-seat spit. They're so close, I feel like I could reach out and touch them. Our wingtips are only feet apart. I can't express, it's unbelievable to see the spitfire right off my way like that! We're retracing the route the Battle of Britain pilots would have taken as they patrolled the south coast. I've never flown in formation. I've never, I've never been so close to another aircraft in the sky. The skill of the pilots is awesome, but flying in formation is just the start. They're going to show me what these warbirds can really do. Thanks, Cliff, that was amazing. Yeah. I, I had more oh wells and ah, oh my what, god. More than me. <laughs> You're so close together. You are so close. That's the one thing that I uh, I hadn't I hadn't um, I hadn't really fully that. entertained in my mind. You are like literally on each other's wing. And 
You're looking over there, it's another aeroplane in the sky. And you think, and it's bumpy sometimes, you know. Oh, yeah. And when it moves, you I was like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it because I knew you'd hear me. But I love the peel-offs. I love that. And I wish I had a camera here looking so you could see what I saw because it was nuts how close we were. So the next trip, you in? Scramble the McGregor big wing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we'll do. Let's do that. We'll do that then. It's been wonderful to fly these planes, but it's been an even greater privilege to meet the heroes that fought in them. What we've learned about the Battle of Britain has brought home to us the significance of their victory. It was a battle that turned the tide of world history, but it took place over our green fields. That's what makes it unique to me, is that it was, it was happening right here, right, right in, you know, above us. Right, and it involved everyone, it involved everybody, you know, so... Um, everybody had to kind of pull together. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's just almost incomprehensible. I don't think we could, can understand what it, it would have been like if it, if, it, you know, if it had gone the other way. Yeah. I think it's true. I mean, I think that this war that happened in the skies here, you know, has uh, enabled us all to have the lives that we've had and will continue for our children and their children. It's really extraordinary. Our journey ends here at Capel Laferne on the Kent coast. This is the memorial to the 3,000 airmen who fought in the Battle of Britain. Here's Douglas Bader. Oh yeah, yeah. Most of them were British, but hundreds came from overseas to defend our shores. It was Czech and Polish pilots, weren't they? There are those who died 70 years ago, and those who survived. Men we've been privileged to meet. There's Geoffrey Wellham's name there, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I like about it, is that it's it's for the pilots who died and the pilots that lived. It's not just, yeah, it's for it's not just a memorial of the dead pilots. It's for all the airmen that took part. Yeah. 544 RAF airmen were killed. Their average age was just 22. We'd like the last word to go to Spitfire pilot William Walker. At 97, he's one of the oldest survivors of the Battle of Britain. Remember those not here today, and those unwell or far away, and those who never lived to see the end of war and victory, and every friend who passed our way remembered as of yesterday, its absent friends, we miss the most to all. Let's drink a loving toast 